Hi everyone, a very warm welcome to this mini lecture. I'm Anna McGuire, I'm lecturer in public history in the department and today I'm going to be talking to you about what public history is and why we should take it seriously. In doing so, I'm engaging with a classic genre of public history, the lecture. While you may think about the lecture as purely an educational tool, it's also a form of public history, one that has historically produced political, gendered, racialized and colonial power. The lecture in Western history emerged from the oral performance of history, a global phenomenon, and grew to be associated with academic authority. The lecture is a performance and it involves interaction with the audience. So your lecturers usually uh, get up in a theatre to try and inform, educate and entertain. As the historian Toby Green has recently described in his own public lecture, the process of awakening in lecture is very important. It is one of the things that a lecturer and a lecturer tries to do, to awaken in an audience an awareness of the significance of the topic at hand. So what I want to do in my lecture today is to awaken in you a new appreciation of public history and encourage you to take public history seriously. It might have been the reason that you chose to study history at university through the horrible history books or playing Assassin's Creed. It might be what your family talks about, about now you've decided to do history, whether that's the new David Olashoga documentary, the museums that you visit while you're here at UCL, or maybe all of your Christmas presents are now public history themed. All of this is to say that you might think of public history as the extra stuff, the historical activity that it happens around the edges of proper history done by proper historians like here at UCL. But what I want to argue today is that the power of public history can be its levity, its fun and its joy as part of its effective repertoire, by which I mean its ability to generate and produce emotional responses, in its ability to reach different audiences and communicate something about the past, powerful in its very existence beyond institutional borders. And that's why historians of all stripes are paying more attention to public history and doing more public history. And as future historians, here's why you should be taking it seriously too. Anna, what is public history? Well, as historians often like to say, it's complicated. For public history, its complexity is mostly in its expansiveness. It's a term which can cover all manner of things. And that creates a challenge for those who practice research and importantly, who teach in this field. For our students who want to study public history, it might be about supporting a path in the heritage sector. For others, it's about wielding history to make meaningful social and political change. And for others still, it might be so that they can contribute to Twitter debates about historical accuracy in period dramas. Part of the way that I tend to make sense of this is thinking about public history as a practice and as a discipline. So I define it as a practice as any genre, process, behaviour or institution through which publics engage with, contribute to, produce or preserve historical understanding. But there's also public history with a capital PH as a discipline or field of study, much like social history or political history or cultural history. Public history is not just a practice, but a theoretically rich, critical orientation about how we think about the past use in the present. Having sketched out what we mean by public history, I now want to explore how and why we do it. Why do people create and consume public history? What are its purposes and what is it for? One place to begin thinking about public history is through genre. The historian Ludmilla Georgenova defines genre in public history as a type of representation, whether in the form of words, displays, pictures or film, that is governed by recognised literary, artistic or institutional conventions, like the novel, the monograph, the diorama or the local history lecture. The concept remains useful despite the diversity within genres, changing conventions and the emergence of new forms. Genres are flexible with intricate histories. This is a notion of central importance for understanding public history. 
because genres involve elements of convention, they are recognised often intuitively by audiences and readers. As a result, there are expectations on both sides that are, in effect, informal rules of engagement. Now, I've already mentioned quite a few genres in the course of this lecture already, but let's have a look at some more. So we could think about hobby art, uh, like this video. Or video games. It could be through historical fiction, like the very popular series of books that are emerging around the Holocaust at the moment, or thinking about comics and zines like the suffragette one you see on the slide. It could also be thinking in about walking tours and the occupation of public space, about food or about rituals. Why are these genres important for us to think about? As public historians, we need to think about what genre is appropriate for the kind of story that we want to tell and what expectations that sets for our audience. For instance, is TikTok the best place for sharing traumatic veteran oral histories? Might the immersive, or the immersive experience of augmented reality work best to transport your audience into a different, unfamiliar time period? We also have to think about our own technical skills and capabilities and the budgets that we have to hand and about thinking about what best suits our audience. Genres help us to think about how history is produced and to think about the rules of engagement that sets this for audiences. But there are other processes for making history that we can think about to extend our understanding of public history. And I'm going to focus on just two here applying the past and playing with the past. Applying the past speaks to how historical sources and narratives are applied to create social and political change. Applied historians who have produced manifestos, like the example on screen, about history's utility, argue that we should, both, we could, we should use both historical content and historical reasoning to clarify public and private challenges and choices. One way of doing this is through history and policy. History and policy is a non-profit network of over 500 academic historians committed to producing better public policy through a greater understanding of history. Work featured on their site thinks about history for policymakers in a number of ways, making comparisons between past and present, drawing lines of continuity between past and present, which might be easier for modern historians to do, or using historical thinking to analyse contemporary issues. In the last couple of years, historians have written policy papers covering medieval revolts and modern mass protest, food banks and the history of mutual aid, or how the First World War might help us respond to mass deaths during the COVID pandemic. But applying history can take some other directions as at a grassroots or ground up level. This could be in the work of History Acts, who bring together historians and activists to build solidarities across time, or in the work of truth and reconciliation commissions and processes, where people share memories and experiences as part of a society's transition from civil war, authoritarian re regime or genocide, as in Rwanda or Argentina, or in the 1619 project, which reoriented US history by placing the consequences of enslavement and the contributions of black Americans at the centre of the national narrative. Playing with the past is altogether more playful than the messages of applied history, but that doesn't mean it's any less effective or powerful in introducing the public to history. In fact, it might even be more so as it's a kind of form of history by stealth. Playing is an important part of learning. 
To play something means understanding how the world of the game functions and to be able to situate ourselves sufficiently within it to imagine how the world could change as the game develops. So this could be through pageants or reenactments or theatrical productions. Many of you may have been on a school trip where you dressed up as a Viking or a Victorian. It can also mean being playful with the past, either through memes or through comedy. Or it can be literal play, from board games to video games. The counterpoint to the processes of producing public history might be how audiences receive it, the behaviours that we undertake to engage with the past. This is one of the key themes of Jerome de Groot's work, Consuming History. Here, de Groot is particularly interested in history as a leisure pursuit, as something that is entertaining, to be enjoyed. And by understanding public history as something that is consumed or commodified, we start to think about the impact of supply and demand, of commercial priorities, or what the consumer wants on the kinds of history that are produced. So we could think about the Bridgerton effect, not only on TV, but on historical fiction or TikTok trends. Or the continued dominance of war documentaries and biographies. There is scope though within history as part of popular culture to shape trends, offer new understandings or to read against the grain, so to push back against the dominant narrative by looking at what's been unsaid, especially through collaboration with audiences. We can work with our audiences to encourage their participation and contribution to the process of historical production, to create new knowledge and understanding, whether that's through big data projects where volunteers contribute metadata, transcription or cataloguing work, to designing and co-producing together. And I've got one example here for you to have a look at, which is uh, the work of the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, which, done, which has done work with its source communities for uh, many of the very colonial items that it holds in its collection. In the photographs you can see on the slides, there are examples of reinterpretation or updated descriptions that also think critically about how knowledge was produced and shared in the past. These examples not only think about the changing behaviours of the museum in deliberately acknowledging their own failures or shortcomings, but they also invite the audience to behave in new ways, no longer passive receivers of knowledge, but challenged to think about how that knowledge came to be there in the first place and to reflect on their own role as visitors to that space. But who are the public and who gets to own the past? These are the last questions that I'm going to cover in today's lecture, but they are not insignificant. We should acknowledge that from the outset, public is a difficult term. There is no singular public for any of our activities as public historians. Them, all audiences or publics are most close, more closely defined than that. So that could be a, a geographically or socially or politically determined public, a specific demographic in terms of age, education level, race, class or gender, or even trying to reach an audience who commonly engages with that form of history. These questions pose their own ethical challenges for us as public historians as we gauge what is appropriate in the competition for attention and commercial success. Different groups also have different relationships and reactions to the past, and this can often lead to contestation about how a historical event should be communicated or remembered or who should be sharing this history. This is especially true of moments of national commemoration, um, which really help us to understand who and what is seen as belonging to the nation. So we particularly saw this during the centenary of the First World War in the UK, activities for which started in 2014 and which came to close in 2018, despite the best efforts of First World War historians to push for a longer chronology. This was a period of immense public history activity with multiple publics. And in the UK, some really important themes emerged in locally funded projects particularly thinking about women's involvement in the war, for instance, um, as well as the histories of uh, Belgian refugees who came to the UK. 
My own work on colonial experience of the, of the war meant that I was particularly interested in how race and empire were represented in the centenary in a context of the hostile environment, Islamophobia, Brexit and latterly the Windrush scandal. There had also been an important study done in 2012 by researchers at the Imperial War Museum called Whose Remembrance, which showed the importance of this representation, uh, especially for young people growing up in the UK. Could a more diverse memory of the First World War be inculcated? Well, let's look at a couple of examples of change during the centenary. The first are the brand new galleries opened by the Imperial War Museum in 2014. One of the core driving features of the gallery was that it's first, it was the first audience without the living memory of the conflict. Curators couldn't rely on what they called the grandfather tour. In audience surveys before the galleries were designed, the curators were shocked by the lack of knowledge of the conflict beyond mud and trenches, and therefore sought to answer four main questions. Why did the war start? Why did it go on for so long? How was it won and lost? and what was its aftermath. But they also sought to highlight the, uh, the global aspects of the conflict and to move to a less Anglo or Eurocentric view of the war. The galleries included displays which spoke to the experience of troops from the West Indies, India, West Africa, as well as New Zealand, South Africa, Australia and Canada. For some though, the galleries didn't go far enough. If they hadn't seen themselves represented previously, the changes felt insufficient. Some other changes were in the memorial landscape of the First World War. Firstly, we have the Lions of the Great War Memorial in Smethwick in the West Midlands, which is a 10 foot bronze statue depicting a Sikh soldier in full length trench coat, which was designed to honour the sacrifices made by South Asian service personnel of all faiths from the Indian subcontinent who fought for Britain in the First World War and other conflicts. By choosing a Sikh soldier, the representative is one of the few groups allowed to fight on the Western Front, and it speaks to ideas about martiality, which tells us something about who or what is chosen to be celebrated. The site was subject to vandalism just five days after it was opened in what was described as a racially aggravated criminal damage, which I think tells us something about the kind of contestation of memory in this period. Secondly, we have the new memorial to African and Caribbean service people that was built in Windrush Square in Brixton. What's mm -hmm. interesting about this memorial and its public is the choice of location. Rather than pushing for inclusion in the more memorial landscape of central London around Hyde Park, where there are memorials to Australians and New Zealanders, as well as the Commonwealth Memorial Gates, the choice of Brixton made explicit the connections between this service and migration and the legacies of empire, as well as meeting the public for whom this was for where they are. As literary and historical scholar Shantanu Das commented in a piece for The Guardian at the beginning of the centenary, the recent global turn in First World War studies and commemorative events is partly propelled by Europe's changing image of itself. We live in multicultural societies. Baroness Varsi, leading the colonial war commemoration, recently noted, our boys were not just Tommies, they were Tariqs and Tajinders too. They came from many nations and held many different faiths. Varsi's is an important caveat, as much too far right parties keen to whiten the war as to ethnic and religious groups who may want to hijack its pluralities. Das would go on at the end of the centenary to comment on how colonial service was instrumentalizes instrumentalised during the four years in many of the ways he had cautioned against. This leads us to one of the most useful concepts for public historians, the idea of a usable past. I'm going to quote Jordan over again. The idea of a usable past is hardly new, but is probably more prominent now than ever before. If the past is usable, then history is an open field that is available to be put to diverse, even conflicting ends. These uses are often found blended together in a world that constantly affirms the value of knowing about the past to inform the present and the future. History as entertainment uses the past for commercial purposes. History as consciousness raising uses the past for political ends. 
history as public education uses the past to inform audiences about political and social trends. So this concept can help us identify where narratives are being produced in service of political or economic projects, and it can be the public history project in itself. How do we as public historians want or choose to use the past? I'm going to finish with one of my favourite examples of a usable past that's now 12 years old, the Olympic Games opening ceremony from London 2012. This example is particularly in my mind because of where the UCL East campus is in the Olympic Park, where I see the stadium every week. As Catherine Baker describes, the opening ceremony is a really important example of public history. It's a narrative of national identity anchored in the past and a creative process of telling that story, similar to theatre or pageantry. She writes that the London 2012 opening ceremony appeared deeply informed by what one might call such a mosaic mode of representing the nation, which presents the nation as the sum of multiple and divergent political, uh, personal biographies. Within this mosaic, we see representatives of all four nations, markers of progress within UK history, not least industrialisation, as well as the NHS, important social and political movements like the suffrage movement and the arrival of the Empire Windrush, as well as culturally significant characters from children's stories and pop culture, uh, all the way up to Tim Berners-Lee, inventor of the internet. The ceremony was understood to be a moment of national storytelling, the creation of a usable past for the contemporary UK, and as a result, it received divergent reception. Whether you saw it as Aidan Burley Conservative MP did as lefty multicultural crap, or as Jonathan Friedland saw, saw it exemplifying the ethos of public service and ethnic diversity, as an expression of radical patriotism or a highly mediated commodity spectacle, you understood this was a statement to the world about how the UK, or at least how Danny Boyle, Frank Cottrell Boyce and the Olympic Committee were choosing to present it. While Boyle has been evasive about his political intentions in the ceremony, Baker comments that any attempt to define national values, which Boyle sets out as tolerance, dissent, inclusivity, engineering, culture, humour, ambition and modesty, is of course intensely political and moreover imposes an unwarranted universalism on the process of generating collective narratives from sources. So when we critically engage with public history projects, we need to consider the kinds of usable pasts that are being produced in these forms. Usable pasts are often seen as a quite top-down process, but it's important to think about how they can, can be generated uh, from the bottom up, particularly important in political activism. As a discipline, public history attends to other forms of knowledge and expertise, from oral history to folklore to songs or cultural practice and intangible heritage, which expands our definition of sources. As we've seen in this lecture, the broad modes and means of producing history for public audiences has made it increasingly accessible for those wanting to do it for themselves. This is particularly evident through public digital histories, through YouTube, TikTok or podcasts. And our job as public historians is to make sense of this landscape and think seriously about what impact this past has on the present. So I hope that today I've persuaded you of the importance of public history so that the next time you're scrolling through social media or watching TV or even just walking down the street, you can think twice about how history is happening in public. The questions we ask of public history are the questions we can ask to history, full stop. Who owns the past? What kind of historical narrative are they telling? And who for? Thank you very much.